of the city that ruled the world. For 500 years, over as much as 2 million square miles, Rome fought, and reigned, and got rich. Today, experts are still trying to understand how. In the ruins of its port, in the mountain of evidence its people left behind, and on the furthest borders of its empire, they find the secrets of the Roman success. They see ambition, innovation, and a genius for organization, diplomacy, brutality, and insatiable greed. While many remember its decadence and decline, this is the Roman miracle, hundreds of years as the greatest power on earth. The dawn of the second century AD. The power of Rome is felt across three continents, in up to 60 million lives. Its empire is the mightiest that the world has ever seen. Its emperor is the most powerful man. His name is Trajan, and he owes it all to war. Trajan is the latest warrior to lead Rome. He carries on a tradition whereby men bring glory to themselves and their city through conquest. With the money he's raised in plunder, Trajan builds himself a monument in the heart of the city. Three years into his reign, the Emperor Trajan conducts a war against Dacia, or modern-day Romania. And as a result, he wins a fantastic victory for Rome. And he builds this monument, known as Trajan's Column, that celebrates that victory. The monument is constructed from 29 drums. Each one, weighing as much as 77 tons, is cut from the finest white marble, a symbol of divine purity. But the column marks a dirty war. Trajan protected his borders with a program of systematic butchery. The way in which victory was won is detailed in scenes which cover every inch of the monument. Carved into the surface of this column is a narrative frieze. If we were to extend it, it would be more than 600 feet, and it narrates the key events, the key battles of that war against Asia. Casts have been taken of the carvings, and by studying them, it's possible to see this column for what it is, one of the most valuable and accurate records in existence of how the Roman superpower went about its business. People have gone and put it side by side with the written evidence that we have for the Dacian Wars and said, well, this incident that we see depicted on the column must correspond with this campaign across the Danube or whatever. It's very historically accurate as far as we can tell. This is the Danube River. This is the river god that lives in that river. And that river is one of the great boundaries of the Roman Empire. You're either inside the Roman Empire or you're beyond it in the land of the barbarians. And in this case, what you have is the start of the war against Dacia in the land of the barbarians. And you have the Roman soldiers that are marching across a pontoon boat. And they're carrying the cook pots and they've got their water bags and their helmets around the shoulders. And they're marching through here and marching finally past the emperor himself, Trajan, with his trusted advisors, with his generals, and with bodyguards, soldiers. And they are planning that great war against Asia. The image of Trajan appears close to 50 times. He's bigger than others. He always looks calm. He's in a commanding pose. And I think that that colors my understanding of Trajan. He was a man who had iron will, knew what he wanted, was very interested in the army, saw what he thought needed to be done, and went out and did it. 
What he does is to make war. Not merely for honor or glory or even for security. For Trajan, for his empire, foreign conquest is an economic necessity. These figures right here represent one of the great benefits of going to war. In this scene we have a couple of Roman soldiers and they are taking their horses and putting on the saddle all kinds of goods, spoils of war. And in this case, they've got all kinds of bowls and cups and plates that would have been made out of metal, precious metal. Dacia was rich in silver and gold mines and the Romans knew that. And they could take back this material and melt it down. And that just became money. Money to finance projects, money to employ Romans. The city of Rome is symbolic of the way in which the entire empire works. Every monument of civilization that you see in the city of Rome is also a monument to exploitation, to violence, and to barbarism in the wider empire. A general's triumphs are all won in Rome's name. Even Trajan, the emperor, is duty-bound to share his spoils with the city and its people. That's how Rome has got rich. He gave a distribution to each Roman citizen of 2,000 sesterces, a fantastic amount of money when you think that one legionary for a year's worth of work would earn only 1,200 sesterces. Trajan followed this with nearly four months of games. An estimated 5,000 pairs of gladiators fight and countless animals are slaughtered. The people of Rome cannot know it, but their civilization stands at its absolute peak. New wealth from new territories appears to make every citizen better off. But this system isn't perfect. Someone has to pay the price. 40 miles south of Rome, the village of Anagni. Archaeologists are trying to decipher a set of ruins. They're unlike any that have ever been found. It's clear that this was once a grand country villa, built around the time of Trajan. But what grabs the experts' attention is one building with a very unusual layout. One thing that just stood out was this funny little grid of walls, a line of rooms, all of exactly equal size, 10 by 12 Roman feet, and what looked like perhaps a corridor on the other side of them. The rooms are small, the buildings reminiscent of a barracks, but this wasn't a place where legionaries lived. They found bodies here. The remains of seven individuals, all infants. So in this skeleton, we look at the length of the bones and these stages of tooth development to look at the age of the individual. And this one is probably about a year and a half old, maybe a little bit younger. Analysis of the bones' composition provides key information. It suggests the kind of lives these people live. Looking at other long bones, we can see the ends are a little bit more porous, so they're, the texture is a little more rough. They're, the bone is less compact on these areas than it should be normally, which would indicate to us that there is some kind of vitamin deficiency in this individual. After four years of excavation, the archaeologists have a good idea that they know what happened here. This was a place where slaves were kept. The owner of the villa most likely owned the people who lived in these cells. There are references to such structures in the ancient texts, but these are the first physical remains to be found. The evidence says that the slaves lived as families, up to six to a room. They had cooking fires, they ground their own grain. We're seeing for the first time something that we can be reasonably certain is a slave barracks. 
This is a key part of Roman life that's often been hidden from historians. There's very little written about it in the surviving ancient accounts. And yet slavery, like conquest, was one of the pillars on which the Roman superpower stood. What you have here is the Roman soldiers, and they've taken the Dacians that they've captured, and they're tying their hands behind their back, and you can see the rope beautifully rendered. They are going to be sold off as slaves. It's going to make money, bring money into the coffers of Rome. There's another benefit. It brings new labor into the Roman economy. It built their city. It kept their city running. <laughs> in fact, by the time of Trajan, up to one third of the population of the empire was human livestock, the property of someone else. This is a slave collar, and it fit tightly around the neck and was sealed. It could not be removed. And there's a tag attached to it. And it says, I've run away. Get a hold of me. And when you take me back to my master, Zeninus, you will receive a gold coin. This sums up the harsh realities of being a slave during the empire. You are a possession of somebody. They've purchased you. And they own you. What happened in Dacia? have played out in dozens of other conflicts more than two centuries. A war became a land grab which yielded untold wealth. It means that once Trajan had finished fighting, he'll rule the largest empire that the world has yet seen. And this is only half the story. What he has acquired, he now has to rule. This is the point where, for centuries, Rome and its empire met. After conquest comes commerce. With every new territory, there are new trade routes, both on land and on the sea. And the port of Puteoli saw ships come and go from three continents. Sailing from here, they could be in Spain or Egypt, both Roman provinces, within a fortnight. Puteoli was the most important port in Italy until well into the late 1st century AD. And you can see why looking at the bay behind me. In this natural bay, you had a large deep water harbour capable of accommodating the largest vessels that they came from Alexandria, from Sicily, from North Africa. And they came because this gave you best access to the markets of Rome. Over the years, seismic activity under the seabed floods the harbour. So most of Roman Puteo is now underwater. In the time of the Roman Empire, though, these passages are at street level. Down here in these very well-preserved remains, you get a real sense of just how busy and bustling a port Puteoli was in the Roman period. All manner of goods pass through here, but what dominates is trade in one particular commodity, grain. You've got a large storeroom area, probably used as a granary much of the time. There's a whole row of them along just this one street. For the citizens of Rome, this place is a lifeline. In an age when most people on the planet are farmers, living on the food they grow themselves, the city's inhabitants are dependent on imported food, and the average Roman man eats two pounds of bread every day. Much of that bread is made with Egyptian grain, and fleets of purpose-built ships constantly make the trip from Alexandria. The capacity to store goods here was massive. And it needed to be, because a large quantity of grain was brought by the emperor every year through Puteoli to feed the poor citizens of Rome. Five measures of grain per citizen per month. The Roman people see these handouts as theirs by right. And even the mightiest emperor fears the power of the mob. If that grain supply ever dried up, there were very severe consequences. There would be riots, and perhaps even the position of the emperor himself could be threatened. 
Under Trajan, a man who because of his military triumphs rules a booming, ever-growing city, this threat becomes more acute. His Rome groans beneath the weight of its own success. Puteoli simply can't handle the demand. Puteoli is the essential port of Rome, but for a number of reasons, it's not enough. Puteoli is too small and it's not that close to Rome. So they decide to develop the area at the mouth of the Tiber River. So they build an interior harbor, the inner harbor of Trajan. And together, around those warehouses and around those incredible harbors, develops a city. And that city is called Portus. Portus is not amongst the most celebrated of Rome's engineering triumphs. But it should be. Here, canals connect a vast man-made harbor to the sea. Today, it's a quiet, reed-filled lake. But in Trajan's time, this is one of the busiest dock sites in the world. The hexagonal harbor encloses about a hundred acres of water. We have to imagine large seagoing ships arriving from different parts of the Mediterranean coming into the hexagonal basin and mooring systematically along all six sides of the hexagon. And it must have been a fantastic sight. To Trajan, this site is as strategically important as any border or fortress. A team of archaeologists has spent the last three years working here, and with every revelation, their find seems more impressive. The facility that stood here was huge. Portus must be one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. There was only one ancient Rome, and Rome only really had one imperial port. Portus was that port. There are warehouses, barracks and offices. At the center is an imperial palace. So far they've excavated only one-tenth of the site. They've found the vast grain stores which kept Rome fed and calm. These are a massive investment in Roman homeland security. But the archaeologists are also seeing something else. Portus did more than simply feeding Rome. It was the hub of a trade network so complex, so sophisticated, it's hard to believe it was part of the ancient world. In front of us here, we've got uh, material of 2nd century AD from all over the empire. These are, in fact, handles of amphorae from southern Spain through to what's now modern Palestine, Greece and Turkey. Amphorae are the vessels that Rome used to transport all kinds of perishable goods. The evidence says that while most of the world lived hand-to-mouth, Portus and the Empire gave the elite of Rome access to delicacies from hundreds of miles away. You could be sitting at your dining table in Rome, you could be eating Spanish olive oil, you could be spreading North African fish sauce on your bread, you could be drinking wine from Palestine, and you could be using pepper and condiments from India as part of your main course. On top of that, you had the luxury trade. Silks and spices from the Far East, from India, Sri Lanka, ultimately even from China. The Romans had an insatiable demand for these luxuries, and as the empire became more prosperous, there was more and more need for this. Trajan's reign was boom time in Rome. At the very top of the system, there is a fantastically wealthy elite. And we can see quite clearly in the archaeological record, that elite gets bigger and richer throughout Roman imperial history. And that was what made Rome, Rome. What had begun as a nation of warriors became entrepreneurs, diplomats, bureaucrats. In the business of government, of trade and taxation, communication and control, the Romans now revealed the genius which made them unbeatable.
Rome under Trajan. The heart of a superpower at its height. With its tower blocks and public entertainment, it's a recognizably modern city, and its problems are modern. Here was a city of a million people needing to be fed. A gigantic great consumer city drawing on the grain and the wine and the oil that is being imported from across the empire. A complex network of supply and communication maintains Rome's status as the richest city on earth. Archaeologists have discovered a method of mapping it. They've done it by looking at what the people threw away. This is Monte Testaccio in a suburb of southern Rome. A hill entirely formed from broken, discarded pottery. Every single fragment is a piece of evidence. Pottery sherds can appear to be a very modest archaeological find. But when you find a great mountain of fragments of pottery, as we do very close to the river Tiber in Rome, we suddenly get an insight into how the Roman Empire worked. These were once amphorae used to transport olive oil. They were shipped into porters from across the empire, transferred by barge to Rome and unloaded into huge warehouses. Since the ceramic was unglazed and it soaked up the oil, each vessel could only be used once without contamination. Before it was broken up here on the bank of the river Tiber, the pieces were systematically stacked to create terraces. They are valuable to archaeologists because each vessel bore its maker's mark, place of origin, and a custom stamp. This is the only place in the world where the writing has survived. So excavating in Monte Testaccio is like looking at an archive, as the painted markings allow us to study the economic life of ancient Rome. This means that archaeologists can trace journeys and trade routes that span three continents. These stamps were made where the jars were produced. In this case, it is Camillus Silvestris who had the jars made up, filled them with his oil and sold it to the merchant whose name is also here. Every pot fragment illustrates the Roman genius for organization, its obsession with order. This is what enables their empire to remain so powerful for so long. Generally speaking, archaeologists are digging up the rubbish, the debris, the discarded, broken items of the past. But when we put together the evidence of hundreds of thousands of pottery sherds, we build a picture of an entire system of production and distribution. Rome has the money and the power to buy or take whatever it wants. It spins a web of trade routes across its conquered territory. They bring goods into Rome and slowly, steadily, they start to make the provinces themselves richer. Officials, governors, are appointed to ensure things run smoothly and that Rome gets its cut. Once a conquest has been made and a province created, that province is milked of its tax revenues. So across the empire, Roman communities begin to take root. Provincial governors have absolute authority and they report directly to the emperor. The empire is becoming too large to govern centrally. When later Romans are thinking about the emperor, Trajan is remembered as an emperor who put a huge amount of effort into appointing high quality subordinates and who endeavored to make sure that the provinces and cities of the empire were governed as well as they possibly could be. When Trajan acquired Bithynia, now a part of Turkey, he put his friend Pliny in charge. 
A file of letters between the two men still exists. It's the only surviving correspondence of its kind. These letters are really interesting both for what they say and for what they don't say. I think it illustrates how administration ran in the second century. It appears the emperor isn't interested in holding on to control for its own sake. The overwhelming concern is to keep the money rolling in. Pliny continually turns to Trajan saying, there's a problem here, what should I do? And Trajan writes back to him saying, thank you for all your concern, you're doing a wonderful job, but you make the decision and get it done fast. Figure it out yourself. I sent you there to do a job, just figure it out yourself. You've got the men on the ground, you make the decision. In these far-flung provinces, the governor's key weapon isn't his legions, although he does have troops at his command. Instead, it's what's called Romanization, the diplomatic ploy of winning over the local elite with the lure of a new life. The most successful kind of imperial government is a government that draws in layers of the local existing power-holding elite and involves them in the business of imperial administration. They maintain law and order and they collect and pass on the taxes. Rome sits at the center like a great fat spider. The entire political setup is a work of genius and nowhere has it functioned so well as here, Italica, in Spain. Perched near the northwestern edge of the empire, with only the Atlantic beyond, it has all the familiar symbols of Rome, including the obligatory amphitheater, one of the largest ever built. It's become a rich and successful colony because it can provide Rome with what Rome wants. When you go to Italica, you, you go and it's in this plain and it looks, seems to stretch on forever. It's hot and dusty and it was just surrounded by olive groves. That must have been the economic basis for this area and they thrived. Rome got its steady supply of Spanish olive oil. Italica got rich and the local elite won power and influence back in the capital. This is the time that we start seeing greater integration of what are commonly called provincials, people from the provinces, born in the provinces, into the Roman governing elite. By the second century, Rome's culture has so successfully exported itself that you can be a Roman without even being born in Italy. Plenty of important men, great writers, aristocrats, landowners, people who epitomize Roman culture. At no stage in their family history do they have a single drop of Roman blood. But it doesn't matter. It was all about culture, it was all about identity, it was all about behavior. It didn't matter what color you were, what race you were, you were a Roman if you did Roman things. And here's the proof. Italica's public baths. They bear an inscription commemorating the town's most famous son. Trajan was born here. He was Spanish. That an emperor came from a Spanish colony tells us what Rome has become. It is so much more than a city. And physically Rome is vast. It has more land than any one emperor could ever see. More wealth than he could spend. More people than he could ever effectively rule. Running an operation this size is a huge challenge in its own right. The time comes when more conquest, more expansion, makes no sense. The Roman Empire has reached a high watermark. A position of dominance, confidence and wealth carved from four centuries of fighting. 
I think the Roman Empire is fundamentally a system of robbery with violence. But then the death of Trajan and the crowning of the new emperor changes the game. The man in charge now is Hadrian, and the empire will run very differently. Trajan represents the old school, the traditional Roman policy of advance, conquest, military glory. Hadrian represents a complete reversal of that policy. This is Tivoli. It's the private retreat that Hadrian built for himself. And here, it's possible to read his entire worldview written in stone. An ancient empire theme park. One where different zones recreate the cultures that now come under Hadrian's control. You almost see the essence of why the Roman Empire was so successful for so many centuries. The Romans were willing to learn from others. They took the best ideas from all over the world. Where Hadrian is different is in focusing his attention not on the lands he has yet to conquer, but on what he already has. He is the first emperor to travel widely through the lands he rules. Hadrian was obsessed with all things Greek. And he read literature, philosophy, liked every aspect of Greek culture. He spent a lot of time in Athens. He didn't just make himself a citizen of the place, he became its chief magistrate and he rebuilt the city to his own glory. One of the nicknames that is passed down for Hadrian was Gregulus or the little Greekling. Under Hadrian, the empire seeks to refine itself, to celebrate its inheritance and consolidate its position. He has all the wealth and all the land that he could possibly use. Why fight for all? This was a center of ruling the Roman Empire, at least when Hadrian himself was here. But it's striking that this isn't a fortress. There are no defenses here. This is the grand house of a country gentleman. So Hadrian's reign marks the beginning of a time of great peace. Hadrian begins to emphasize the Greek tradition of art and civilization and architecture and science and so on, because that now becomes the motif of empire, not conquest, but the building of civilization. The change in priorities filters down and spreads. It's a moment of equilibrium. Civilization is flourishing in the cities of the empire. It's the period of great monumental architecture. And in Rome, where Trajan has his column, an eternal celebration of pillage, plunder and killing, Hadrian creates a monument which is grander still. His Pantheon, arguably the most perfect of all Roman buildings, is just one of the fruits of his reign. The ability to understand literature, to appreciate art, to want to build something that will last forever and be beautiful. That, I think, is a remarkable achievement. This is a unique time in the history of the Roman superpower. Its military triumphs are fresh. Its coffers are full and its reputation is at an all-time high. The century that follows Hadrian's reign will be the most peaceful and prosperous in its history. Rome will dominate for generations to come. And yet the seeds of its downfall have already been sown. In the 3rd century AD, Rome is a city at peace. The days when an emperor pursued glory through conquest are just a distant memory. There are other ways to win the love of the people. This bath complex, inaugurated in 216, is one of the largest and most lavish in the history of the empire. It is a gift to Rome, and it is meant to inspire all. So these massive concrete pillars that we're looking at here were actually 
on the outside of the building and we're looking into rooms and facing these rooms in between the concrete pillars would have been walls of glass. Glass walls have a dual purpose. They trap solar energy to warm the rooms beyond. But they are also testament to a different kind of power. No other civilization could mobilize the resources or the skills to produce anything like this. This is a building that would have been mind-blowing and still is today for its sheer scale. A small town could fit inside of this thing. That's what we're talking about. It's absolutely gigantic. And what's even more amazing is that it was built in only five years. Day in and day out, you had 9,000 laborers on site here working on the construction of the Bats of Caracalla. And when they'd finished, every citizen of the city, up to 1,600 of them at a time, could enjoy the kind of luxury that elsewhere was the preserve only on aristocrats. Going to the Baths of Ancient Rome is basically experiencing all the aspects of the city. It's like ancient Rome and a microcosm. The ritualized routine of bathing is one which brings different classes together. It's like going into a spa and a gym and a health club all together. You arrive, take off your clothes, and you're heading off to the gym where you're getting a workout. You're lifting weights, you're wrestling, you're socializing. Then you make your way into the rooms of the baths. And some of them have pools of water that are cold and unheated. And then you can proceed into rooms that are warmer and warmer and warmer. And this is an incredible experience. But coming here is about more than getting clean or getting physically fit. The 1600 Romans who came here every day weren't just enjoying this place as a health spa and a gym but also as a center of learning and high culture. In fact, the bath complex included two libraries, one for Latin texts and one for Greek texts. So this was a place where you came to refine yourself, both mind and body. When we're here in the baths, it's an experience of total leisure and enjoyment. We are far removed from the wars that are taking place on the borders and the fringes of the empire, thousands and thousands of miles away. It's the last thing that you're thinking about. That's what separates these third century AD Romans from their great grandparents. These Romans were not expecting to go out and fight. Since Hadrian had set the boundaries of the empire nearly a century before, a fundamental shift had taken place. Whereas Rome had once defined itself as a military state, one driven by conquest and battlefield glory, its armies now played a passive, marginal role. Their job was to protect, to preserve this way of life. Rome is fighting a series of wars, but they're taking place in the deserts in the Middle East, they're taking place in the northern border of Britain at Hadrian's Wall. The Roman military machine is better than ever before. It's also more stretched. It has to police countless tribal territories, hundreds of cities, trade routes, and shipping lanes. At the Empire's height, there are 50,000 miles of paved road and up to 5,000 miles of frontier. So, who's manning the borders? It's men who were born, raised, and live their entire lives in the far-flung corners of the empire. Rome became a superpower because it had a strongly militaristic culture in which everyone was expected to train for and serve a lengthy term in the army. But by the 3rd century AD, the Romans are in fact outsourcing their military to people who, simply put, are not from Rome. It's been 200 years since the Romans fought a major battle on Italian soil. They created a template for living that's been taken up by millions. 
And so Rome, the city, is losing its edge. Its superiority, its ability to dominate were once obvious. But they've begun to slip away. Though its people enjoy a life that others envy, Rome's long decline has begun. In the 3rd century, the Roman Empire comes close to collapse. In the past, it had faced countless revolts, famines, plagues and natural disasters. Its ability to endure is proven second to none. But now, a number of crises all hit at once, all on a grand scale. The borders of the empire are struggling to fend off hostile incursions. Inside the Roman state, there is infighting and bloodshed. Emperors didn't trust their own generals or their own ministers, and they knew they couldn't be trusted. The statistics speak for themselves. Of the 28 emperors who take power in this period, only six die natural deaths. To rule in Rome is to be the most powerful man on earth, but the likely price is a high one were more likely to be executed or killed by another Roman than you were by foreigners. In 250 years of civil war, the Roman Empire rotted from the center, tearing itself apart until neither the emperor nor the empire could deal with any new problem. And through this internal feuding, Rome loses its focus. It loses its ability to identify the threats that face it and deal with them. Storm clouds are gathering particularly in Northern Europe, and increasingly the balance of power is shifting against Rome. As Rome falters, its enemies draw strength. The German tribes of the Rhine and the Goths of Middle Europe are massing on the frontiers. They all turn against Rome. For the first time in generations, the city needs physical defenses. Rome was being challenged by barbarian armies and they felt it was necessary to construct a massive defensive wall circuit 12 miles in length. In 410 AD, a Visigoth army reaches the walls of Rome and lays siege. The Visigoths from Northern Europe were down and outside the gates of the city. Some sources say that it was slaves that let them in, and then the unthinkable happened. Rome was sacked. The barbarian army is led by a king born in a Roman province. He's fought in Rome's army, become one of her generals. The man is a product of Rome. And so are the men he leads. They've served as mercenaries alongside the legions. They have insider's knowledge of the way Rome fights its wars. They've marched south, looking for new tribal lands. At first, they'd wanted not to destroy, but to belong. Only when they'd asked for and been denied full Roman acceptance, did the Visigoths launch their attack. These people and their commander have actually served as part of the Roman army at various stages. It isn't quite the full barbarian rampage. The aim is not to bring down the Roman Empire or wipe the city out. The Gothic sack of Rome is in effect a heist aimed at carrying away gold and silver. The army of the Goths are maybe 10,000 men, perhaps 40,000 at the most. It's very difficult to steal and rob everything. It's very dangerous to split up. So they tend to focus on a few areas. They go to where the rich people live. They go to where some of the temples are. They head to the place where business is done, where the bankers and tax collectors work. Rome's ancient heart, the Forum. Basilica Romilia in many ways sums up the whole history of Rome. It was built in the 2nd century BC when the Republic was at its height. It thrives throughout the Empire, but in 410 AD it's one of the victims of the sack of the city by the Goths. They destroy large parts of the city, they plunder more, and the Roman Empire will never recover from this attack. The scars are still visible today. 
The building was burnt to the ground. If you look down here on the marble, you can see the stains left from where the coins melted and permanently marked the marble. The fire at the Basilica is so fierce that even its mighty marble columns burn. And the more important the building, the greater the target it is. The Goths tear their way into this tomb, built four centuries earlier for one of Rome's most revered rulers. The structure in front of me is a 14th century castle, but originally it's conceived as the mausoleum of the Emperor Hadrian. Rome is sacked, the mausoleum is plundered, and his ashes are scattered. The empire limps on for a few more decades, but its last emperor is overthrown in 476. It's inevitable, not merely because the heights reached by Trajan in war and Hadrian in peace have never been recaptured. But Rome has reigned supreme for centuries. Rome was the dream of glory, the dream of success, the dream of ultimate power. But its history also contained the warning. Empires will fall no matter how great, no matter how successful. Every superpower will eventually die. The institutions of government collapsed. The armies disintegrated. The great Roman building projects fell into disrepair. But 500 years could not be erased, even in the so-called Dark Age which followed. Our buildings, our laws, our language, our culture, our military, our engineering and our government they're all constructed on foundations laid by Rome. 